Welcome as we continue our Wednesday morning Bible study. We're in John chapter 19, looking at these particular verses in the crucifixion story. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus, that you love the world so much you were willing to give your Son in such a barbaric way in this death of crucifixion. So help us grow in our appreciation and understanding of that wonderful gift that offers us life eternal in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at John chapter 19, and we finally got to that point where they were handing him over to Pilate, and they said, we have no king but Caesar, and Pilate said, then we'll crucify him, and he handed him over to be crucified. So in verse 17, it tells us the soldiers took charge of Jesus. It says, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. So here we see Jesus, and it says, bearing his cross to this place of the skull, apparently not far outside uh, the city walls, is this Golgotha, Calvary, as it's referred to as well. Uh, normally when they carried, however, most often, not the full cross as some might think, but often sort of the cross piece. So when you had the cross, there would have been these upright pieces in the ground, and the cross piece is what the person would carry with them on their back, strapped to them, or maybe just trying to navigate it on their own. Typically there might be a hole or type of thing in the middle that they would hoist it up and put it on top so it would slide down onto the top piece of the cross is one thought as to how this went on. And so uh, very, still a very heavy piece, a very heavy burden that this person would carry. Um, some say this is representative of a typology going back into the Old Testament. So we take a look, for example, at the story of Abraham and Isaac. Here is Abraham taking Isaac, his son. He was going to uh, kill him, sacrifice him. And remember it said, Abraham carried the fire, Isaac carried the wood. And Isaac said, where's the animal for the sacrifice? And Abraham said, God will provide. As far as he knew, it was going to be his son, Isaac. Turned out not to be the case. We thank God for that. But that was part of the imagery here of sort of a typology. The son carrying the wood on his back for his own uh, death, his own crucifixion sort of thing. Uh, so here Jesus carrying uh, the cross on his own. Some say it's the Persians who invented uh, crucifixion. Uh, some say it's the Romans that perfected it. Uh, some say the Assyrians and earlier uh, are also connected a little bit with crucifixion. Jonah, for instance, when he was told to go to Nineveh and preach, he understood they had a variation of crucifixion where they would just have the single stick in the ground, some say, and sharpen it up and then put it kind of in the middle of your back and let you hang there, stuck in your back that, that way. And so Jonah knows if he goes and preaches this message God wants him to preach, that's where he may end up. So when God said go, Jonah went the other way. Didn't want to do that. Uh, so the Romans perfected it and made it sort of an, an institution. Uh, it was usually referred to as the execution for the worst criminals and also perhaps of the lowest classes uh, designed to uh, make this a public humiliation. If you watch, for instance, an old movie called Spartacus with Kirk Douglas, you see toward the end of that movie, uh, scenes of crucifixion. And in that movie, crosses lining the whole Appian Way on the sides of the roads with bodies hanging there. And that's where Spartacus is hanging. People stopping if they might know these people, trying to help them or give them water or do other things with them. And uh, even though the Roman soldiers tried to prevent some of that. And you can see the agony and the pain of these who are being crucified. So again, a way in which it was sort of a humiliation, uh, the death perhaps ordained by God here, in that this was also humiliation in the Jewish culture, to be hung on a tree, as it was called in the Old Testament. 
It was not supposed to be a pretty, uh, pretty sight, very degrading. Um, Cicero, Roman statesman, said this, it's a crime to bind a Roman citizen, to scourge him is an act of wickedness, to execute him is almost murder. So what shall I say about crucifixion? Very uh, painful, very uh, agonizing, and, and not a very pretty way to die. Uh, so Cicero says this isn't a very uh, polite and proper thing. Um, the victim was um, in a lot of pain and agony. Death was there. Uh, some think by um, suffocation. Um, some think by dehydration. Uh, some think by uh, exposure, because it was also crucifixion that was done without clothes, usually naked. Uh, the Jewish culture said we wouldn't want them to be done naked, so out of respect we try to provide at least a loincloth for that one who was hanging there. Uh, but just a very uh, painful, agonizing way to die. And that's what the uh, Jews had wanted to have happen, perhaps so that they could bring pain and agony on this Jesus, so that they could disprove him and discredit him to anyone who was following him. Uh, and so Pilate then puts this inscription. It was not uh, uncommon for a title or a nameplate sort of thing to be placed over each person who was crucified, giving their name and trying to specify their crime and what they might have been guilty of, that they deserved a crucifixion. So here we're told that Pilate uh, wanted this statement regarding Jesus to be as public as possible. So he has it put up there, it says in Aramaic and in Latin and in Greek, which were the common languages of most of the folks who would be around there, what they would understand. Greek being the common language of the uh, Roman Empire and the Roman culture, Latin as well, Aramaic from the Jewish people. Um, so it's written up there. Uh, you may have seen or you may be familiar with it some places that you have seen things written, you may have seen this. I-N-R-I. -I. That's part of the Latin phraseology. Uh, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Iudeorum. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And notice here, even in his death, in his death throes, he's identified as Jesus of Nazareth. Remember we said when they came to arrest him in the garden, that was sort of a term of denigration of him. Are you this Jesus of Nazareth? Because we had heard earlier in scripture, what good things can come out of Nazareth? Nothing good. And so that was another sort of humiliation step for Jesus to be referred to as the Jesus of Nazareth, even on the cross. Uh, but again, Pilate puts king of the Jews uh, and Pilate says, what I've written, I have written. Again, Pilate, remember, wrestled with, what is this man guilty of? I find him innocent. I find no crime that we can charge against him. And eventually it's the uh, high priest who says, well, he claimed to be God. And that's the crime we have in, in front of us. And Pilate got a little afraid with that because remember, the Roman culture was familiar with those who could be part God and part human and, and not knowing what might exactly be talked about here with this Jesus. Um, but he puts that up there because that's the only thing he could come up with as something worthy of crucifixion. These Jews wanted him crucified. But now the Jews are upset. Don't say he is our king. But he said he was. He claimed to be king. And Pilate said, it's too late. What I've written, uh, I've written. Um, Pilate finally finds courage, I suppose, to stand up to these Jewish leaders, even though it's a relatively unimportant kind of a thing. But at least Pilate has the uh, guts here, some might say, to stand up to these Jewish leaders. Didn't have it before, but maybe a little bit now. I'm not going to alter it. I'm not going to change. In fact, actually, Roman law prohibited that. He couldn't change the sentence once it's been pronounced. And so the crime had to remain the same. So here Jesus crucified, an agonizing type of thing. Uh, when they carried the cross and the arms over there, debates over where nails were placed, were they placed in the hand, in the wrist. Uh, most say the hand could not physically take the weight of the body, but there are others who say we put the nail here and they would lash the arm down, uh, do the same on the other side, put the nail in the hand and lash the arm down with rope so they could hang there on the cross. Some say there was a little footrest as well, perhaps, that they could push themselves up. 
but that was where the suffocation would come in as their body weight would drag them down. They would suffocate, couldn't get enough air to breathe. They would push themselves up. Some people took as many as three to five days to die and they didn't want that time on the cross. So the soldiers would come and try and break the legs. That way you couldn't push your body up anymore. It would be too painful or it might put you into shock and speed up the death process in lots of different ways. But when they came to Jesus, we'll see later, that didn't happen. So here, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and the Jews are debating this title and what's going on. It says, then they crucified him in the center with two others, one on his right and one on his left. And we're told they were uh, criminals are identified or thieves are identified as. We don't know exactly what their crime was, but apparently worthy of crucifixion. And is it important that Jesus is in the middle? That's been debated as well. Is that just the chance of where he was placed? Or is this uh, one who can uh, focus us on some symbolic natures? Jesus centered in the middle of humanity, some would say, and he's crucified in the midst of humanity. Others say, well, crucified in the midst of sinful people. Psalm 22 tells us, be crucified among the thieves and the sinful people. Some say uh, centered between uh, belief and rejection, uh, centered between uh, the confusion of the world, and Jesus now brings the center and the focus to all that. Some say centered between those who are saved and those who are perishing. Remember one criminal finally comes around and believes and the other continues to rant and rave against Jesus. The other one says, don't you know he's innocent and we're getting what we deserve. So here's this one who is centered between the believer and the unbeliever. Others might have said he's centered because Jesus is the relationship, our uh, intermediary between God and man. So he's at the middle of all that. So uh, lots of different things going on here with how the crucifixion uh, was involved. These two who were crucified with him. Uh, we get then this other image that says if we continue in verse 23, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. And this garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. A Roman crucifixion usually supervised by soldiers. Uh, different ones would have this duty. Some thought it was a privilege. Some thought it was a pain. And it was the worst duty they could have. Uh, so here apparently there are four soldiers who are observing this particular thing. Whether all four of them are there for all of them or just for Jesus. We don't know but part of this whole group that is there on this hill of crucifixion. It was not uncommon to take their garments. Um, what remained of their material possessions. Sometimes that was one of the uh, perks, some people might say, of being on crucifixion duty. You might obtain some clothing or some other items that might be there as part of the person who is dying. Um, again, ordinarily crucifying people naked, but at least the Jews tried to encourage at least a loincloth or something to make it uh, presentable to the public. Um, the tunic apparently is the one garment that uh, was without seam, it says, woven from top to bottom all together with no seams or no breaks. So they didn't tear it, they cast lots for it. So the main garment Jesus wore was made well enough uh, that it was better not to tear it into four parts. And so it says to fulfill uh, what scripture says, let's not tear it, but cast lots. And again, that goes back to Psalm 22, uh, about dividing the clothing and casting the lots and everything that's there. So we see lots of different dynamic here to what's going on. It goes on then, it says, it, so this is what the soldiers did, and in verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son, to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her in to his home. So there were people there. We read in some of the other gospels, there were those who walked by, uh, who didn't quite understand when he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. They said he's calling Elijah. And, and some said, well, let's wait and see if Elijah comes. Why Elijah? Well, Elijah, as we know from scripture, did not die. 
taken to heaven with that fiery chariot that carried him away and there are many who feel he was going to return before the end of time would come or that Jerusalem would be restored we see people thinking John the Baptist is Elijah he preached in some of the same regions that Elijah did and some say dressed in the same way others if you have the the Seder meal the Christian Passover you leave a spot for Elijah at the table to wait for his coming again so there are those who might have been confused. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, the Aramaic uh, statement, and, and my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it says the people didn't quite understand. Others, it said, came by in one of the other gospels. They were wagging their heads. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Perhaps people who are familiar with his story or with his miracles or had seen him in his ministry it said now he's unable to save himself. And others who came by and said, uh, you're the son of man, you want us to believe, then come down from the cross, rip out the nails and the ropes and whatever and come down and we'll believe. So apparently this was not uncommon, much like we might say in our uh, early West, everyone would come to town for the hanging. There's going to be a hanging and we'd all want to see it and this would be a big, almost a big social event. So people would flock to town and want to be there for the hanging. A uh, similar type of thing with the crucifixion. This was part of what some people might say, unfortunately, the entertainment of the day. We don't have television, we don't have radio, and so we go uh, to something like this, much like we have the events that we know about in the Colosseums, events with gladiators who would fight to the death, events in Roman chariot races like we see in the movie Ben-Hur and other stories. Where So this was the entertainment type of thing for the people. They would go and they would watch others kill others and, and fight to the death and do other things like that. So it was not uncommon for this to be part of an event. Uh, so there were people who came. Some of them were the religious leaders who just wanted to make sure this Jesus was dead. Others might have been those who just followed along and wanted to see what the entertainment was for the day. But we're told there were people there. Uh, apparently not a lot of his disciples as we read, they were still in hiding and they were fleeing and, and, and they weren't there. Um, but there were people who would come to these events and be part of what these events are all about. And that's part of the challenge we have in our culture today, that people would glorify these kinds of events and that they would look uh, for the pain and agony of death as they would see them. But we do get recorded here by John that his mother is there. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. To the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. So John is there, apparently Mary, his mother. Um, and they each obeyed this sort of solemn command that Jesus gives them. And some have said, well, wait a minute. Didn't, didn't Mary have other children and other ones who could take care of her? And yes, um, she did. Uh, but perhaps Jesus did this for who knows what reasons to emphasize that our relationships are in him and in the kingdom and that's even more important than blood relationships that's why he gives her to John some have said perhaps he did this to honor this disciple who's one of the few who's actually there at the foot of the cross and his mother who was there in her agony and pain Remember, this is the same woman who nurtures a little baby in a manger and has shepherds who come and give testimony to his greatness, wise men who come and bring them these special gifts and spectacular gifts, and others who appreciate this one who is this new baby who is born as a Messiah, a Savior. They flee town and get protected by God when Herod tries to kill all the babies. They're guided by God when Herod dies to come back from Egypt to their city of Nazareth where Jesus grows up. So this is this same woman who's seen all that part of his life and watched him grow into the man that he is, perhaps even witnessed a few of the miracles. She's there at the water to wine and others, and now has to witness an agonizing death. It must have been very hard for her as a mother to go through that type of thing, to see that. So perhaps Jesus recognizing John and her we're told that some of his siblings weren't exactly followers of his and we don't know where they were at at this point in time as far as their faith or their belief in him or where they were so to just leave her to be cared for by them may have not been the best idea either so we're not quite sure why all this happens but 
Jesus doing this to give concern for his parents. We also think perhaps Jesus may have known that John was the only one who would live a long life. He's the only one of the disciples who isn't martyred early on. He's exiled, but he does live to a long, ripe old age. Um, so who knows exactly the reasons why this was done. Um, just maybe out of simple wisdom and foresight to try and care for his mother. But behold your mother, behold your son. Not a lot of specifics here. Not a lot of dynamics here about, well, take care of her, take her into her house, make sure you provide for her, make sure you care about her. Not a lot of that, just a simple understanding. Woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Uh, and they understood all the specifics that were needed, which is a piece of what we also see throughout Scripture. We don't get a lot, for instance, of all the specifics of the crucifixion, all the exactness of what happened and exactly how that happened didn't need to, most of the writers felt, because the people of their day understood that. They knew when they talked about crucifixion what that image was that came to mind. Just like when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, a lot of the good Jewish people understood what that meant. It opened up for them all these pictures in their mind. So the same thing with crucifixion. Don't need a lot of explanation of the details. Most folks of that day understood that. It's us, maybe for our sake, that we need to investigate and look at all the details that are there. It's quite enough what we have here and quite enough what's written here. So we continue through these powerful end hours of the life of Jesus. And next time we get together, we'll talk more about his actual death and all the pain and agony that comes with the people of God as well as with our Lord himself in that process. So join us for those as we continue our study of John. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, as we see this event of crucifixion begin to unwind and take place in its pain and its agony, again, increase in us an appreciation, a love, a care for all the things our Lord Jesus endured for our sake. We can't begin to understand the pain and the agony that he went through, not just physical, but all the emotional, mental toll of taking the weight of our sin upon himself. So help us to grow in our faith and understanding through Jesus. Amen.